Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay respects to leaders past, present and emerging. The Understanding Boys podcast is a series of conversations exploring what it is to be a good man these days. So if you had a story about being a good man and that you could tell a 14 year old boy and he'd actually listen, what would that story be? And that's really what I'm asking our guests today. I'm Dr. Ray Swan, And we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys in the modern world. The series is brought to you by Brighton Grammar, an all-boys school in Melbourne. To learn more about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. In today's podcast, we speak with Steve Biddle. Steve is one of the world's best-known parent educators. He's been a psychologist for over 30 years and continues to write and teach. Steve's books include The Secret of Happy Children, Raising Boys, The New Manhood, and now 10 Things Girls Need Most. His books and talks have influenced the way we look at childhood, especially the development of boys and men. Steve was made a member of the Order of Australia for his work in young people's mental health. He's got two grown-up children and lives in Tasmania with his wife and co-author Sharon and Associated Wombats. We were lucky enough to catch Steve on the fly long distance from Tasmania. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. Hello, Ray. Great to talk to you and your parents. Thank you. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's a real privilege to be able to speak with you. You're someone whose work I've followed for a number of years, read lots of your books. I remember actually going back a little while now, going to one of your talks, and you told a story about, and I won't steal your thunder, but you told a story. Um, about a phone com- a phone conversation between um, a son and his dad. And it, it, it's amazing to me, um, you know, just how powerful uh, that story was and just how much it's actually stayed with me for, you know, over 10 years now, um, the recounting of that story. Your work has certainly had a, a very large impact on many people and myself uh, as well in particular. Well, I'm really pr- proud to have contributed to, to what people that are a lot more intelligent than me and doing wonderful work around the world. If I can provide some tools, um, that's a, a fantastic thing to know. Absolutely. Steve, I, I suppose I was keen to, um, to get started in a conversation with you today. You know, you've done so many things, whether it's uh, as an author, you know, a speaker and presenter, you've started work and treatment facilities for refugees, you know, your youth line, um, and where it all began, you know, as a psychologist and guidance officer in the education department in Tassie, um, a little while ago now, I might say, sort of around 40-ish years ago, it's extraordinary. You must have seen a lot of changes in your work over time, particularly around men and boys. Yes, the changes have, have been wonderful to, to see because... Um, Back when I started, my very first book was called The Secret of Happy Children, and it, it was based on my work in Launceston, which is, Launceston's a pretty rough town, and it was a lot rougher back then. Most people worked in textile mills and things like that. And we had a really simple goal, which was to persuade people to, to not hit their children or not, not yell at them and tell them that they were terrible. And so the whole idea of positive parenting, where you actually show your love to your kids, because... A lot of dads didn't have that in their background. They thought they were to just be the disciplinarian and the breadwinner. And, and we, we realized that fathers were really struggling. And so the message that came out in Raising Boys was to, to tell dads that they, they actually had a really special role with their children. They weren't just a walking wallet. And the great news about that, as you said, what's changed, Ray, uh, over the years is that this generation of dads today, the fathers who will be listening to this podcast, they're putting in about three times as much time with their children as the earlier generation. It's a much more hands-on, friendly, engaged kind of fathering. 
And, and that's a, a, an amazing change in one generation to have seen. And the difference to the kids then, and of course, it's not across the board. There's a lot of variation within families. But, but in general, dads want to be close to their kids now. And we're seeing that happening. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. And it, it fascinates me, Steve, as a school teacher, you know, just how often young people with mom or dad, you know, just that idea of being seen, you know, it, it just, it, it's something about whether it's the adolescent process or just the developmental process, or maybe it's something that never leaves us, is that that real need to be seen for who we are, you know, what we might be, who we're becoming, and, and have that, I suppose, witnessed, I mean, it's probably a, a bit of an old fashioned word, but that idea of being honoured by somebody else, you know, for that unique genius and, and what makes us all different seems to be part of the human condition. That's quite a deep comment or deep question, Ray. And, and I think you're exactly right that we have an idea in our heads of, you know, I'll have a son, you know, I think even as teenagers, we, we think, oh, one day I'll have kids. And most people seem to kind of design the child they'll have. And when that child actually comes, <laughs> comes along, they never, they never ever fit the mold that we, we have to, as you said, see them for who they are. You have to get to know your own child because they'll be unique and they'll have difficulties that we'd never have thought of. We tend to design a kind of a, a, a glowing stereotype of a son or a daughter. So it's really, really important to... to mm get to know the child that you've got and appreciate their uniqueness. And, and I, I know from the very early days, we were all set in our family to have, a, to have home births on our farm and we were going to have our children born in wonderful you know, candlelight and fireside glow. And both of them were emergency caesareans, big rush to hospital, total panic. And I was lucky enough, I was in the operating theatre when my son was born with a mask and a gown and I put the mask on the wrong way around and all the <laughs> doctors are laughing and I was feeling like a complete idiot but from the very first the message was nothing ever goes to plan yeah. um, parenthood is a is a rolling disaster which you sort of recover from and, and find your way and if you have that humility about it it seems to really help because then you're thinking okay what is my son going through how can I find where he is and, and meet him where he is or with my daughter, meet her where she is. And so they feel, like you said, seen mm. and experienced as a, their own person, not someone who's there to fill anyone else's dreams. Yeah. Yeah, what well, you were saying about, you know, nothing going to plan and that notion of, particularly for men in, in their fathering, of having humility. There's a, you know, a humanity or a softness or a gentleness that's probably different to, you know, what we'd understand to be the traditional male having to be the provider, having to kind of be the boundary setter or the one who shows model strength in a way that the generation again before them had to endure, um, you know, things in the earlier part of the 20th century, how difficult that would be. One of the things that a lot of people are starting to talk about now is, is around male shame. And, you know, I, I just was thinking a bit about your book, you know, your, your more recent book in Raising Boys for the 21st Century. And you talk a little bit about, you know, the, you know shame as a, as a real influencer on people. And it's interesting because there's an, another work that's come out quite recently, which also points to, to male shame. And I wonder in your thinking, and these are not, this is a conversation, these are not, you know, psychological correlates or anything, but I'm just wondering, is there some kind of a connection between you know, young young people and young boys in particular feeling shame that they're not quite lovable for who they are because their parents and their dads in particular haven't actually recognised within them. And the dad in, in himself hasn't also doesn't have that humility or softness in being able to recognise that. I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that, Steve. Yes, there's so much to say about this. The, the first thing is that for, for males in particular, shame is really, really toxic. And People often say death before dishonor, that, that people would, you would literally um, rather be killed than be uh, humiliated. And that's a reflection of how shame is very, very crushing. And if a boy isn't 
matching up with someone else's expectations. And, and in these narrow ways, we say you, you must be good at sport or you must be this or you must be that. If he feels that, that he isn't good enough, and I think pretty much a whole generation of, of men in the 20th century were raised, they were never good enough. Mm. And the, the ideals of manhood, say back in the 1950s, were specifically designed for cannon fodder, for, for sending men to war, to be soldiers of empire. And so all those things of not showing any feelings, having a stiff upper lip, being like a, kind of like a log of wood that was the ideal male. And every man who was doing that felt down, deep down quite inadequate because he knew he was frightened. He knew he was, you know, was not able to shape up in the in the, the ways that he was supposed to, and it was an impossible ask. And that's why we had massive alcoholism amongst men in this country, and domestic violence. Most domestic violence arose from shame, feeling that you couldn't make enough money, or your wife didn't love you, or those kinds of things. That the, the, the man wouldn't just say, you know, like I feel vulnerable or inadequate. He would hit out to try and get back on top of things. So it was a disaster in the 20th century. And the, the reason I wrote the manhood book was to, to try and give men a, a feeling that, of connection with other men that wasn't based on competition all the time and, and trying to prove something. Mm. Because what kids want, they don't want a, a log of wood at the dinner table. They, they want a, a, a warm, caring, funny kind of guy that can, they can be close to. And um, if they've got a dad who, who comes, comes home and says, oh, you know, I was pretty scared. Someone nearly ran me off the road. They think, oh, wow, you know, dad, he's big and strong and he's fantastic, but he gets scared. Mm. Um, if dad says, oh, I'm, I'm really sad, you know, that my, my mum's getting so sick and, and, you know, that she might not live for much longer, that little kids think, wow, you know, dad gets sad and he's okay. And so we give them this sort of internal permission by our example that how to be a rounded human being. So it's a great paradox that the, the more that, that the men relax and, and be themselves, take the masks off, the better parenthood will function and, and their, their kids will feel in a funny way braver, more willing to take risks and try new things at school. I'm sure you find this as a school and as, as teachers, you, you're wanting those boys to... To try new things and try writing a poem or try volunteering for a sport that they've never tried before. That's how learning happens. And so it's a big benefit to, for everyone if, if we get a, an idea of masculinity that's more open and, and real. It's what you're saying, Steve, in terms of the, you know, being a, a dad and, and having those, those two things and being not a log of wood, but, you know, someone who's capable of feeling and showing and discussing and, and opening up, it is fraught, I think, for men because, particularly in their parenting, because you know, how do they also still provide? You know, the you know, in the same breath, we talk about we wanting people to be more resilient and to be able to bounce back, and you know, what life is hard, and you know, we've got to be able to face that. And so, I, you know, I think it's hard for you know, for mums and dads, but dads in particular. Um, in this particular space, uh, you know, with with the way the sort of the societal determinants, if you like, of the way men should be, uh, do, do you have any advice for dads? I mean, how do they kind of practice? You know, is there like a, you know, and I know there's bits in the book, but I mean, you know, what would you say to a to a dad or even a mum who might be listening to this for for, um, you know, to chat to a dad about? I mean, what 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 are some sort of skills or how do we kind of flex the you know the emotional muscle that that helps us to get better at this sort of stuff? Well, I think the basics are very, very simple, um, that kids need to spend more time with us. And so uh, having a dad who hangs out, um, watches a movie with the kids on the weekend or walks the dog with his daughter or his son is not especially rushed or busy. Is probably two-thirds of the story because... The dads who are taking the trouble to listen to this podcast, they're going to be caring and involved with their kids. So it's just that your kids don't get enough of you for that to download. There's a, a really amazing thing in neuroscience, which are called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are built through our nervous system and they mirror what we see. And so if we watch tennis, our mirror neurons 
start going into tennis mode. If we watch dancing, they go into dancing mode. And we think this is how we model complex behaviors. And so if our kids see adults who are caring and kind or patient or funny or resilient, to use that word that you used, they drink that in to themselves. It's not what we say. It's what they sort of download from watching us. And so uh, the son would watch his dad speaking to his mum and say, oh, you know, he, he stood up for himself, but he, he didn't shout. He wasn't mean. Um, they had a discussion and they had different points of view, but they were still nice to each other. Yeah. And that's a very complex learning for that boy to have, how to be around a woman as an equal, not be a, a doormat or just cave in and become all bitter and twisted and not, not be a bully. That takes probably 10 years to learn how to relate to the opposite sex in, a, in an equal, lighthearted sort of a way. And so that means kids have got to be around grown-ups who are doing that. And so in my Raising Boys talk, I write it huge across the board, spend time. Mm. Um, and then there are some of the things that make it more easy to interact. And the, my big one of that is, is rough and tumble play. It turns out that the, in the biology of boys, and uh, Richard Fletcher has researched this um, at the University of Newcastle, that dads who, who play rough and tumble games right from babyhood, you know, picking them up and, and, and r- bouncing them on his knee and that wrestling and, and, and fooling around on, on a physical level seems to make both boys and girls feel that dad is approachable and, and you can wrestle with dad and built into that is it's never angry or hurtful that it's Mm. it's always dad is managing it so that we're safe and so that the kids are taking in um we're an affectionate family we play we muck about we can get serious when we need to but we can muck about as well and so it seems to put the dad into a place where he's someone that in your body you feel safe with I always wanted to design an ad, Ray, for, for television or for billboards. And it was a career, Steve. Yeah, a little, I was a little kid reaching up. You just saw this hand and, and the, the words were, I always feel safe with my dad. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the slogan. That's the, 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 the punchline. I always feel safe with my dad uh, because many of the people listening to the podcast today, that wasn't exactly true for them. Mm. There was always that feeling like that they could get a slap across the back of the head or their dad would lose it and yell at them. And we're never going to feel safe in the world and we're never going to be able to be completely honest unless we have that sense that even on a physical level, um, no one's going to hurt me in this family. No one's going to reject me or judge me. I can be in trouble, but it's never going to be at the core of my being. It's always going to be, I did something dumb. I feel, I feel embarrassed and a bit ashamed that I did it, but at that central core nothing can ever fail me as a human being because you know when we're long gone when our kids are in their 40s and 50s and we're in our graves what we're wanting is that they remember us they remember the love that they got from us and deep inside them they feel a sense of peace and warmth that they're worthwhile human beings now you never get that from your workplace You, you never get that from your pay packet they can only come from with mum and dad, I always felt safe and welcome mm. and that they delighted in my company. They just thought I was delightful. Mm. It does mean some, some of you have got teenagers who are anything but delightful in your houses. And so you, I'm not saying that's easy. You have to really work at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I remember hearing um, you know, someone say that you don't always remember what people say, but you, that you always remember how they made you feel. And I think with the, you know, you were saying earlier about the play, um, I, I'm not sure if you supported me, but I, I've seen it read somewhere, or read it somewhere, I should say, um, you know, where that rough and tumble play helps with, you know, understanding the difference between being assertive and aggressive. Now, we want our kids to be able to be assertive and, you know, be functional and have agency and, you know, do things and have voice. Um, but not to the point of, you know, of damaging others or, or ultimately themselves, of course, or their communities by not knowing. I think of it a little bit like, it's probably overly simplistic, but, you know, my little lab, which is not little actually, she's huge now, um, you know, learning about, you know, the biting instinct and nipping and just that sort of sense of, well, where do we, 
sort of fit. How do how do kids test that? You know, in a, in a in a way, it's like yeah, fair enough. You're being assertive, and I'm hearing you, and you're upset, or you're this versus you know being destructive. Yes, it's a, again, it's a really um, maybe one of the top three lessons in life for a person for their life to go well is to 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 know that particularly with boys that I think we're wired up. Males are wired up for, to go straight from from feeling to action we wired up for rapid response and that's just a um, biological necessity of our history as you know hunter gatherers and so we have to have the capacity to rein that in and to have breaks on that as well and so one of the things that that i think is really helps is as we're teaching our kids is to notice the effect you're having on other people and so to notice when you, someone you're talking to is is wincing or is is um, pulling back in that you've you've been too loud or you've been too too forceful in, in movement or in, in speech and you know parents often say well Steve you're you're not against you don't like hitting you you, you say in your books don't don't hit your children are we allowed to shout at them <laughs> and I and I say They're well of, <laughs> of course you know you've got to get their attention somehow but Keep your eyes wide open because if you're telling off a child, there'll be that little flicker in their eye that you've got through. And the second you've got through, you back off and you, you don't keep going because many people listening to this will have been around a parent when they were a child. And the, the parent just goes on and on and it's like being a nail hammered into a log of wood. And it's a really terrible feeling to be around a big person who is not noticing that you're overloaded. And so when we're assertive with our kids, um, if we, the second that they've got it, we, we back off, we say, Does, you know, I'm sure you know what I'm, I mean. That's, I've got this through, haven't I? Mm -hmm. They will feel such a relief that we haven't hammered them. But I think they'll learn, again, they'll learn that by example. Mum and dad never beat me up, you know, physically or verbally. And so I won't do that to other people. Mm. You'll have kids in your school, Ray, who they do. They get yelled at so loud and so, you know, insensitively. And those are the ones that are very likely to be bullies themselves. That, there's, mm. that kind of behavior has a history. And, and so we have to look at ourselves. And, and, you know, I remember times with my son. I didn't know I was as loud as I was being. Mm. But I could see in his eyes that, that flicker and then feeling ashamed of myself that I'd scared him. And you know, and really resolving, I don't want to do that anymore, and I have to change my ways. Mm. As a um, you know, as a father, and now you know, heading into the grandparents era, and you know, we we talked earlier about you know the your career and and work and and changing, you know, fr from your vantage point now as an elder in the community. You know, how has that been for you? I mean, that's an amazing journey to be on, you know, as a, the one-to-one, -one, the counsellor. And then, you know, what are you learning about now, you know, as, you, as you're heading into that part of your life? What's changing for you? Wow, you ask deep questions, Ray. And, <laughs> I mean, I have a, these days, I have this enormous concern about, about the climate emergency and and because we can raise lovely kids but if the, if you know the whole world is turning into a civil war because of famine and and problems with agriculture and weather and refugees you start to look at these big questions and as a dad and as a granddad um i think you want to try and fix those things to fix the big picture but also i think the main feeling i have is gratitude i just feel really grateful my kids are, are, are lovely human beings and it doesn't feel like they had a lot to do with me. It just feels like I got lucky. I was grateful to live in a time in the world where it was safe. There, 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 no one's shooting anyone in, in this country and, and it's, 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 it was an amazing thing. Um, we have a beautiful country and our kids have nature and so few kids now, you know, if you look at Hong Kong and there's places in the pictures that kids now hardly see a tree. And so I have a feeling of gratitude and a feeling of purpose that I wish everyone had that. I'm not planning to retire because we're still so far from where we need to be, where every child in the world feels safe. And I think if we can raise our kids who are so privileged to be like 
kind of an army in in World War C, you know, for the the, the war for climate and the war the war for for justice. Um, perhaps some of their current problems of wondering how they look on 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 Facebook and Instagram might just dissolve because it's very good for people to have a, a greater purpose and a greater goal, and that, that's certainly staring us in the face now. We have to we have to save the human race and where it's going and. and we need those smart young kids with their energies and their idealism to show us the way. Yeah, to do so. Um, Steve, we're, we're almost at the end and I was hoping I might ask you, um, you know, what in your thoughts, what, what does it take to be a good man these days? Yes, well, it's the same as it has always been. I, I once asked a room of 300 women to design the perfect man. It was a, it was a rather hilarious time we had. And they called out many, many words and we put them on the board, but it all boiled down to two things. And it was backbone and heart. And backbone was things like being true to your word, sticking with it when the going got tough, being trustworthy and capable. You know, it's no good being a fun guy if you're a drunk as well and, and you don't show up when you're supposed to. So you need backbone, but you also need heart. And, and so you can be gentle, you can be forgiving, um, you can be open-hearted yourself and show your, your, your tender side. There's no reason why you can't have those two qualities in the same man. And I think women are just yearning for, for that in, in the men in their lives. And, and that's what we're wanting our boys to turn out like. So it, always look at it, you know. Does he need more backbone? Does he need more heart? How can I work on that? And that's what my books and my teaching is all addressed to in a nutshell. Beautiful. That's amazing. Steve, thank you so much for your time today. We, um, you know, we asked our, um, our community through uh, Understanding Boys if they wanted to develop a quality in their sons, you know, that was the most important thing. It was interesting that they said overall it was kindness, which I found amazing. Ah. And, uh, you know, you're someone who just seems to radiate kindness. Every, every time I hear you speak or having the, the pleasure of being able to interview today, um, it really is a gift. And so I know many of the listeners would certainly share my view, and that is thank you so much for the work that you've been doing. Uh, it's an absolute honour to, to have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, we're very grateful for your time. And, and again, um, you know, we wish you all the best in, in the next part of the unfolding of, of your life and your life's work. So thank you again, Steve. That's really great. Thank you, Ray. It was a wonderful time to spend with you. Thank you. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app. And please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.